On Friday, May 24, 1957, Emmanuel Akinyemi was working at the Gloucester Road Underground Station in London. As a foreman, his job included taking tickets and operating the lift. At 10.20 p.m., he heard someone running up the emergency staircase. If someone were fast enough, they could make it up the stairs before the lift got back up to street level and avoid the lift attendant and paying their fare. Then, Emmanuel heard a woman yelling, Bandit! Bandit! He had just brought the lift down to the eastbound platform and saw a tall, white-haired woman slowly stumbling towards the lift, clutching her chest. When he asked her about the bandits, she replied, I have been knifed. It was then that Emmanuel noticed the blood seeping through the woman's jacket, down her left side. Emmanuel quickly helped the woman onto the lift and began bringing her up to street level. He asked her where the bandit was, and she told him she did not know. Authorities would later come to the conclusion that the person Emmanuel had heard on the emergency staircase was the culprit making his escape. The woman was already too weak from blood loss to speak much more. Once the lift reached the street level, Emmanuel left the woman with the station inspector and ran to call for help from a nearby public phone. Police Constable Ron Sherfield of the Metropolitan Police happened to be passing by outside of the station and was called in to help. He stayed with the woman as she was transported to St. Mary Abbott's Hospital, and she spoke her final, labored words to him. I was on the platform, then stabbed. The woman passed away not long after she arrived at St. Mary Abbott's, just after midnight on May 25th. The woman was 73-year-old Countess Teresa Lubienska. The native of Poland had been living in London since the end of the Second World War. She had spent the night of May 24th having dinner with friends at their home in Florence Road, Ealing. She had left the gathering with Father Krasinowski, a Polish priest. They boarded the Piccadilly Line at Ealing Common and rode together until Father Krasinowski disembarked at Earl's Court. The Countess had remained on the train until it reached the next station, Gloucester Road. A post-mortem examination revealed that the Countess had been stabbed five times by her killer. Two of the wounds had pierced her heart. The other three wounds were in her chest, stomach, and back. The weapon used was a very small knife, no more than two inches long. The Countess had been born Teresa Skarzynska on April 18, 1884, in southeastern Poland. She came from a noble family and was educated at a prestigious all-girls Catholic boarding school in Ukraine. She acquired her title upon her marriage to Count Edward Lubienski in 1902. Following her marriage, she went to live on her husband's family estate in Lazhov and became an active member of the Polish Red Cross. She and her husband had two children, a son, Stanislav, born in 1906, and a daughter, Isabella, born in 1910. During the political upheaval that followed the 1918 Bolshevik Revolution, Count Lubieski was stabbed to death, and the family estate was seized. The Countess and her children then fled to Warsaw. Her son Stanislav chose to go into the military and graduated from Cavalry Officer Cadet School in 1928, ranked second in his class of 50 cadets. He rose to the rank of captain in 1936 and was killed in September of 1939 as he fought during the German invasion of Poland. Perhaps as a way to cope with her grief, Countess Lubienska became an active member of the Polish resistance against the Nazis and German occupation. She helped find aid for civilians suffering under the occupation, and her apartment was one of the earliest places where the secret meetings of the Polish resistance were held. In 1942, she was reported to Nazi officials, who searched her apartment and found the escaped prisoners she had been hiding there. The Countess was arrested and sent to Paviak prison for her initial interrogation. From there, she was sent to Auschwitz, where her prisoner number, 44747, was tattooed on her arm. She was then sent on to Ravensbrück, where she was sentenced to death. Her sentence was commuted at the last minute due to the intervention of the Swedish Red Cross. Countess Lubianska would remain at Ravensbrück as a political prisoner for over two years, during which time she was tortured and became gravely ill. Despite all this, she remained serene and strong, according to those held with her. 
Instead of focusing on her own suffering, she instead tried to help her fellow prisoners, to whom she showed great kindness. She earned the nickname the White Angel during her time in the camp for her efforts. The Countess was able to survive in the camp until she was finally released and then fled to London, where she was eventually reunited with her daughter. She lived modestly in a one-room flat in Cornwall Gardens, Kensington, and dedicated her life to helping other displaced persons and concentration camp survivors. She founded, and was the chair of, the London Association of Polish Ex-Political Prisoners in Germany. Her work over the years following the war had put her in contact with more than 1,000 fellow Poles now living in England, and 5,000 Poles scattered throughout the rest of the United Kingdom and Europe. Following the Countess's death, the General Secretary of the Federation of Polish Exiles in London, Mr. T. Hesiak, said, This is a great shock and loss to the Polish community in London. The Countess was very well known and very well esteemed throughout Poland and by every Pole in this country. She was a woman of much bravery, very religious, and always the champion of the poor. On Sunday, May 26th, more than 3,000 Polish exiles attended Mass at Brompton Oratory, where special prayers were offered for the Countess, described by the officiating priest as a devout and brave daughter of Poland. Following the Mass, more than 300 people remained in a private chapel, lighting candles before an image of Our Lady of Czestochowa, and kneeling in prayer until early evening on behalf of the Countess and her memory. The Countess's political and social activism was, of course, immediately considered as a potential motive in her murder. Her daughter, Isabella, was convinced that the crime had a political motive. It is possible that her killer could have held extreme political views and disagreed with the Countess's opposition to the Nazi party or her work on behalf of displaced persons. A popular theory in the Polish community at the time was that Countess Lubianska had been murdered by a Soviet agent or by a treacherous member of the Polish community now working for the Soviets. However, the small knife used in the murder seemed like an improvised weapon, and the well-lit platform full of witnesses was an unlikely location for a planned assassination. A more popular theory early on in the investigation held that the Countess had run into someone she recognized from her time with the Polish resistance on the platform. She perhaps saw someone from Poland who had cooperated with the Germans during the occupation. This theoretical person may have felt it necessary to kill the Countess on the spot to prevent her from exposing their secret. Supporting this theory was the fact that the Countess had a remarkable ability to remember faces. She could remember people with ease, even though she knew so many people as a result of her work. Countess Lubianska's activism and ties to the war of course, may also have been purely coincidental, and she may have been the victim of a random crime, such as robbery. There was no indication that someone had tried to grab her handbag, but she could have been killed by a panicked thief following a botched attempt to steal from her. Those who knew the Countess believed that she would have fought back against anyone trying to rob her. The Countess's repeated use of the term bandit following her attack would seem to support this theory. A bandit is generally defined as someone who steals or plunders. However, the Countess was known to use the term outside of its widely accepted definition. Speaking at the inquest into the Countess's death, one of her family members, Adam Antony Bielanski, testified that she used to say that word very often, describing some hooligans. I remember it very well. Speaking about some people who are drinking too much, making a noise, she used it very often. This ties in to another possible motive in the case. While Countess Lubianska was a champion of the poor and lived modestly after the war, her younger years as a member of a noble family still influenced some of her views. She had very strong opinions about proper behavior and was not afraid to voice them. She disapproved of rowdiness, vulgarity, and drunkenness, and expected others to behave with the same sense of propriety she did. According to a station porter, there had been a group of young people, at horseplay, on the platform shortly before the Countess arrived there. She may have reprimanded them for what she considered misbehavior, and been killed in a subsequent argument. Police were never able to determine the motive in the murder because they were never able to identify the killer. This was not due to a lack of effort, however. The exact train the Countess had been on was identified, 
and the time of her arrival at the station was placed at exactly 10.19 p.m. The driver and guard on the train were interviewed, but could not provide any useful information. More than 200 trains on the Piccadilly line were examined. Dozens of police officers searched the various sections of the station, as well as the surrounding tunnels, thinking that the murder weapon may have been discarded. It was never found, despite the fact that for several months, any knife found anywhere along the underground was turned over to the police for examination. Photographers and fingerprint experts were on the scene quickly after the murder and worked alongside police officers throughout the night. The only blood evidence left at the scene was in and near the lift, so the exact location in the station where the Countess was stabbed could not be identified. Police were able to determine that 17 people had left the station around the time the Countess was killed, but had trouble tracking them down. They identified two individuals in particular they believed may have witnessed the crime, as they were seen running from the platform shortly after the Countess was stabbed. One of them was a smartly dressed woman, wearing a black coat and red high-heeled shoes. She was carrying a black handbag, had black hair, and was around 20 years of age. The other potential witness was a fair-haired man with a medium build, estimated to be 27 years old. He was clean-shaven and approximately 5 feet 8 inches tall. Neither of these witnesses came forward, and no one could identify them to police. The police therefore began going door-to-door -door in the area, looking for people who had been at or near the station that night. More than 2,000 homes were visited as a part of this effort. In the three months following the murder, more than 18,000 people, living locally and abroad, were interviewed in connection to the case. Despite this extensive effort, no arrests were ever made in the case. The formal inquest into Countess Lubienska's death was held on August 19, 1957. The jury returned a verdict of murder by person or persons unknown. More than 60 years later, the identity of that person or persons still remains unknown. Funeral services were held for Countess Lubianska on June 1, 1957, at Brompton Oratory, and she was buried at Brompton Cemetery. The Polish government in exile posthumously awarded her the Golden Cross of Merit with swords, an award given for wartime acts of valor and bravery under perilous circumstances, but not during combat. While Countess Lubianska's legacy has lived on in the community she so loved, so has the mystery of who ended her extraordinary life.